Welcome everyone to SEO Office Hours. My name is Michael Chidsey. I'm an SEO here at Good Signals. And part of what we do along with special guests are these Office Hours sessions where people can jump in and ask their questions around their website and web search. By the way, nobody here is in the hot seat and we might not know all the answers, but multiple heads thinking about a problem should help. We have a bunch of questions submitted already as you can see, but if there's anybody here live on the call that would like to ask any questions, please just flag yourself in the chat functionality and uh, that will be monitored. And also we usually have tons of SEOs on the call. And if you would like to share your perspectives, please do. I think that's one of the best things about SEO office hours is there's never one, one solution to problems and actually having lots of people sharing ideas and so on is, is great. Every week with me today is Joe Juliana Turnbull, also known as SEO Joe Blogs. Joe, good morning. How you doing? We're back. Good morning. Yes, we are back. Oh, back after a week off. Yes, a week of another little Christmas, sorry, Easter break. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Really pleased to be back. As uh, Mike mentioned, I'm Joe Juliana Turnbull, and I run a remote digital marketing consulting business called Turn Global. We help clients that want to expand their audience into different markets and go global. But we also have offices in Barcelona and Brisbane. And outside of that, I run two networking events. One is called Search London. It's been running for 13 years. And one is called Search Barcelona. And actually, we have our next in-person event on May 10th. So that's going to be in Barcelona. And as well as that, we do online events too. Today, I'm really pleased to say we have Jack and Natalie joining us today. We have uh, Natalie Slater. Actually, Natalie was one of our first guests back in November. So thank you for coming back and joining us. Natalie is a highly experienced freelance SEO consultant. She has a background both working in-house and also agency side. And she's also spoken at many events, including Search London and also an event here at Barcelona run by Minty Digital. She works in many different aspects of SEO, including strategy, technical aspects, migrations, off-page, and she's worked across a, uh, numerous verticals. So I will share uh, Natalie's LinkedIn connections here in the chat. And also we have on with us today, Jack Chambers Ward. He is an SEO specialist and podcast host. He has over 10 years experience and he's currently the marketing and partnership manager at a Norwich based digital agency called Candor. And actually he, along with Sarah, who's also in the audience today, they are running a live podcast at Brighton SEO. Candor and SEO Mindset are running this uh, event on April 24th. And I will share with you in the chat that it's called Importance of Being Authentically You. And that will be on Wednesday, April 24th in Brighton. It's a free event, but if you are signing up, please make sure that you attend. And I will share with you his LinkedIn profile and also the event bright details. And I just wanted to give that opportunity if Jack and Natalie wanted to say a few extra words before we go in to the SEO office hours. Just to thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. I'm a long-term watcher and listener, so it's very cool to be on the show. Well, thanks for trusting us again, Natalie. <laughs> but you oh, thank you for inviting me again. <laughs> yeah, I have nothing to add. I thought that was a great introduction. Thank you. Perfect. And but if you're speaking at other events, uh, please also mention now or also in the chat later where we can uh, find you. Mm, I'm not sure it's been confirmed. I might be doing something in a couple of weeks. It's not been announced yet, but mm, I will. Top uh... secret stuff. Oh, yeah. I like it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. It could be happening. Jack, what, what about, so you've obviously got the live version of the podcast um, with Sarah. What, how is that different? Uh, how does it feel running a live podcast versus just doing the regular recording? It, it's very different, actually. Yeah, it's, it's ah. a thing because I've been doing podcasts for 12 years now, something like that. And not always about digital marketing, but it's actually quite nice to transfer that. I've also been playing in bands and stuff, so I'm used to being on stage for years and years. So it's nice to combine the two and actually have a an audience to directly ask questions. What we're doing on this show, right? We have the chat to ask questions here and now. And having that interactability, getting people involved in the show and hearing people's stories. I think those live podcasts really focus on us sharing our experiences, that's me, Sarah and Tasman, the three of us, and talking about the positives and negatives of attending events, the stress behind attending events, and all that kind of stuff. And this one coming up, we're talking about being authentically you and basically understanding when it's right to 
brand yourself and understand how to be yourself. And I think that's a lot of things, it's something a lot of us struggle with, to be honest. I think a lot of people, especially earlier on in your career, you really struggle to find your own voice and find yourself to be like, oh, should I be in this niche or this industry or whatever? And it's nice to have not only I'm not the only host, I'm not the only uh, person doing the talking. It's nice to have Sarah and Tasman there as my co-host buddies there to share their thoughts and I'm learning as much from them as the audience are as well. So it's really cool to get their perspectives. And I love the SEO mindset. I'm a listener of theirs. And I think we're planning, this is again, breaking news. I don't know if I can say this, Sarah, but I'm saying it. Uh, <laughs> we're planning some more collaborative podcasts going forward as well. And uh, yeah, we're bigger and better than ever this year. I think we're planning, we're going to have a musician as our intro. We're going to have a Ooh. some acoustic yeah. accompaniment. We've got free pizza. We've got free drinks, all kinds of stuff. We just had snacks and stuff beforehand, but we're going bigger and better than ever so yeah if you can attend if you are going to brighton seo it is the wednesday before brighton seo so please do come along oh great thank you very much and i also wanted to give a welcome to everyone that's joined us live Hamad, sarah albert isaac mary gatsi and johnny and everyone that's also watching us not live if you're enjoying the video i'm sure you are please click a like and subscribe to the youtube channel Great. By the way, apologies to anybody that I, when we did the promo, I had Greenwich Mean Time on instead of British Summertime. So if anybody turns up just as we're finishing, I'm sorry in advance for that and we'll update that in future. Let's jump straight in. We've got loads of questions. And as I said, feel free to add some in the chat functionality. Okay, very long question, so bear with. I'm starting a new role as an SEO at a company who has done minimal SEO so far. They do have, however, they do have a rather large blog. So far, when writing articles, they use primary keywords and no secondary or semantic keywords. This feels wrong to me. I've always used multiple secondary keywords for articles. So I'm very confused. The company's in the B2B space and it's in private in the private labeling industry. So my question is, what are the benefits of using multiple secondary keywords versus just using one primary keyword. The question's in the chat, by the way, and we'll put it in the <laughs> on, uh, on YouTube as well, just in case you didn't catch that. Who would like to kick off? Joe, how do you fancy going first? Yes, totally fine. Yes. Hello, everyone. So I would say <clears throat> the way that some people do SEO is different. But <clears throat> what I would say is it's really important to think about topics so your main sort of theme for that page and then with that you can have the different keywords because I think if we go back to a few years ago it used to be that okay we'd have just one page one one page to rank for just one specific keyword but really it's expanded a lot more and developed since then and it's all around the sort of semantics so I look at a page what is the topic of that page and I actually divide into primary and secondary keywords I don't just focus on one and then I use the primary keywords in the heading tags the, the page title and I use the secondary terms for within the body of the text so I going back to the question what are the benefits of using multiple secondary keywords versus just one primary I think the it's about actually having more of a, a natural, it's more natural. People don't use just one keyword, they use a semantic. So you're actually in, you're actually going to be in the position to capture more of the market. And you'll be able to see also how you're ranking for different keywords. If you just focused on one, then there's a lot of effort just on that one. If people stop using it, then it's also not very natural. So I would say the best way to approach it would actually to be using a topic and, the, and then actually go into primary and secondary keywords. If you have an actual live website, I'd actually run it through tools like SEMrush or SE Ranking and actually find out what tools, what positions those terms are ranking for. And also use Google Search Console. That gives you a lot of information too. You can see what that page is ranking for and if there's any kind of relations that cannibalization with others so those are my recommendations for this particular question great uh jack natalie would any of you like to add anything to that i i echo joe's um thoughts on this completely i, I was just thinking about the distinction between primary and secondary keywords and thinking that's not a, a way of looking at keywords that i've personally used for I can't remember the last time I did. I think it would have been appropriate when 
mapping keywords to e-commerce pages, category pages, when you're being quite clear about the category that, you know, so if it's a, a page about trainers, that's the primary keyword or white trainers, black trainers with a blog post, it may be that you're answering one specific question and that, and you could be treating that as a primary keyword, but there still is going to be a lot of semantically related stuff that to, to, that you could add to that to make that answer a lot richer. That's all I'd add. I think, but it's really, it's the way we all tend to approach SEO these days is in topics and clusters and themes rather than, because primary and secondary keywords sounds like just a, just a very binary distinction of, oh, you have one keyword and then you have a secondary. No, there's, there's so much more to it than that. Perfect. Jack, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I to totally agree with you both, Joe and Natalie. I think there's a that topic cluster thing we've talked about a lot over the last few years. I know a lot of people have been building tools around it and all that kind of stuff. And I know here at Canada, we have also asked that our, our team built. I take no credit for that. I'm not Schilling or anything like that. I, did, I was not part of the team that built that. I take no credit. But it tackles those zero volume keywords, right? Stuff that you wouldn't even think would necessarily be a keyword. And as, exactly as you were saying, Natalie, you might be answering a question that somebody is asking might be a, a thing that doesn't show up on tools. You could be using SEMrush, Ahrefs, SE ranking, whatever you're using, but it shows up nothing, zero, or doesn't even allow you to get data for it. But people are still asking that question. I know that's something SEO director here at Canada, Mark, talks about a lot, that the power of zero volume keywords and just writing naturally, like Joe was saying, you build that topic all together and say, oh, what are the kind of questions people might be asking around this topic, or around this subject? answer them in that blog post, answer them in your whatever you're writing. And I think that can cover a lot of things you might even necessarily think of being covered when you're looking at tools, when you're just focusing, like you said, Natalie, on just the binary of primary and secondary. But when you branch out and think about how to answer it fully and how to cover everything about that topic, I think you can really find some gold that you might not have found straight away. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, go for it, Jane. No, I was, I was just going to say we have some comments in the chat actually as well. So, but you can go first, Mike, and then I'll go back to yeah. the comments. I was going to say whenever whenever we're creating a blog post, you might use a few keywords as like a starting point to maybe do some research and so on. But actually what I find is once we've published something and then we go into Google Search Console and just look at that particular page a week or so later and see what it ranks for there are also tons of other opportunities so it feels like you would really be missing out by just focusing solely on that one primary keyword versus the the approach the person that's asked the question wants to take whether thinking about loads of other secondary keywords or, or however you want to name it I think from the question, it sounds like, uh, so you mentioned that the company has done minimal SEO so far and they've hired you as an SEO. So there also might be a little bit of confidence here, a confidence issue. And I, in, in terms of wanting to do what you think is right, but it sounds like if they've done minimal SEO, they probably don't really, they probably didn't really know what they were doing in the first place. And so you're the SEO. And if you think that's the way to, grow the blog and try and drive more organic traffic, then I think I would at least test it or stick with it and prove the concept. But I, but yeah, we might use, as I said, a handful of keywords as just a starting point, but everything we ever publish ranks for a ton of other things that we weren't expecting. And it just seems like you're, you could potentially be missing out on opportunities by just sticking to that one. And also just from actually previous experiences, some people that aren't in SEO, I find that they get hung up on particular keywords, on particular primary ones. I'm thinking of one particular example where I used to get all the, asked all the time how we're ranking for a particular term. And it just didn't get any search volume or anything like that. And it's so easy to basically uh, drive your entire strategy on, I think they call them hippos, but the highest paid person in the room where you basically, you're b because they're your boss, then you end up doing that. But I personally think that if it, it sounds like you know what you're doing. So I would go with that, test it, improve the concept and open up Search Console and show them those posts that they've done so far that rank for loads of other terms, not just those primary ones. Great. Sorry, Joe, you wanted to um, run through the chat. No, no, that's, that's good. So yeah, I think what we summarized today is like everyone has a different way of doing it, but uh, be confident in your, be confident in your approach and, and go forward with it. So yeah, we have a lot of actually chats about this uh, particular topic. So Gatsby saying, talking about use related keywords 
or using related keywords shows you what you are talking about and helps us satisfy the EAT principle. Yeah, so basically saying that, yes, it's important to not just focus on one particularly primary keyword. Sarah was saying I also like using also as to find longer tail keywords and FAQs. That's true. That's very good. I do like that one as well. I'm saying using secondary keywords give chances of using long tailed keywords, which are useful in SEO. Secondary keywords also invites diversified traffic of users to the website. Um, so also just this point about primary and secondary keywords. I know Natalie, you were saying it, you didn't use that. In some companies, they use it just purely to, I, I think, really to organize the terms. I don't think that it's necessarily any less important the secondary so going back to Isaac's point saying that my two cents here no one no user believes that their keyword is a secondary there's always the debate on what I should do with keywords is it secondary or is it secondary of this content or perhaps could it be used by another article the most important thing is to think about the intent behind that's true and how to help the user and semantics are really important of course and it's also really important to have these semantics because you do not do keyword stuffing so yeah lots of information here another one from monsi is when answering questions it's important to think about what your audience may need each topic has a different angle so this is another thing actually so you might find actually that this one page doesn't actually fully answer maybe your topic you might think oh actually we might actually create a second page for this too i would say if you're new to this role as well don't don't cut time short for you and, and make sure that you have enough time to actually investigate all the opportunities because you're also learning about this product as well. Another thing from the chat is, yeah, Sarah's saying what I find interesting is that keywords with a lower search volume tend to send more traffic. Yeah, so what you were saying as well, Jack, I don't think we need to be focusing on these massive high search terms because it's really sometimes it's the, it's more important to focus on the smaller ones uh that actually do generate traffic and just about this one around um low traffic terms we're talking about b2b and we're talking this question was about b2b in a private labeling company so they're not really going to have high search volume terms either and also for things that are new coming out like new tech products they won't have a lot of search volume and also you can bring that out to different e-commerce products too, Christmas or new product launches. They're going to have low search volume, but you still want to target those key keywords. Yeah, so lots of chat. So thank you very much, everyone, for answering all those questions. Great. I think it's, I was actually speaking to somebody this week where I sound like a politician when they say, oh, I was speaking to this person in, in Sheffield this week. But no, I was speaking to somebody on the phone this week and they were saying that they're down on their organic traffic and they the, the strategy that they've been going with is one that's been pushed on them. And they disagreed with focusing on this basically new product and it distracts them from their main business. However, that's what they were told to do but now it's coming now they're at the end of their quarter and they're looking at their results and so on it's the seo person that gets in trouble for organic traffic not being where it was or doing as or growing at the level it has been so that i just think it's really important to remember if this is something that you're being measured on and you disagree with that strategy then it, it's worth pushing through with what you think Cool. Okay. Ne next question. We're in the process of migrating our CMS, waving goodbye to WordPress. Mm -hmm. Currently, I've got 24 posts tagged as orphan content. Should we bother moving them or should we just delete them and cut down on the per page migration costs? There's also a second question. Also, could you share any common pitfalls to steer clear of during a CMS? Natalie, how do you feel about starting with this one? Yeah, no problem. Great. I first thing I would want to know is why there is a per page migration cost. I that's not something I've heard of, but that might be how you're being charged for the work. But I would be suspicious of that, especially if there's only twenty four of them. But with your question, like usually from an SEO standpoint, with the migration, we typically want to just make sure everything is appropriately dealt with, and the vast majority of times that is redirecting it somewhere else. We only tend to allow things to 404 if they're really if there's no appropriate place for them to be redirected to. I won't say definitely you need to redirect them, but without seeing exactly the pages that they are. But generally speaking, I would migrate everything. Yeah, I'm not sure about per page migration cost. Common pitfalls. 
I should stick over on during CMS migration. I, I, I am sorry, I'm going to have to say it depends. It depends <laughs> on the CMS that it's migrating from and to, because that some would be much more straightforward than others. You're moving from WordPress to something else, which I feel might be, which might have more complexity attached to it than the other way around. Someone else speak. I'll have, give some thoughts sure. to the CMS question. Jack, Jack, have you got anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good point, Natalie. If in doubt, migrate everything, I think is a pretty good rule. Like you said, I've never heard of a per page migration cost. I've done a dozen or so migrations in my career. Like I've never, we don't, that's not how we do it here. That's not how I've done it at previous agencies. So that's an unusual thing. Maybe that is the case for you, but I wouldn't think 24 extra pages should be too much more hassle. I guess my question would be, why are they orphaned? Why have they been flagged mm. as orphaned? Have you done that on purpose and they're just old and you just don't care about them anymore? They've just been left in the chronological nature of your blog or whatever it is, like that kind of thing. Or are they accidentally orphaned and, oh, we didn't update those internal links and we forgot about it and, and that kind of thing. If you think it is relevant and still important content that should be on the new version of the site, migrate it if it's not and it's old i've had clients who have had blog posts from like 2012 and i'm like maybe don't bother the, the you're working in a tech company you're so it's so out of date now things move so quickly information from 10 years ago is not going to be relevant so let's not bother really interesting point but the, the common pitfalls there natalie i think you're spot on like moving from wordpress from my experience it can be the tiny little things of for example the subfolder changes from product to products and you didn't catch that S and those tiny little spelling changes, like the common thing moving from WordPress to Shopify, to give an example from my career, going to collections from categories or making sure that Shopify doesn't pull through the subcategories to the URL and things like that. There's so many issues with that kind of stuff, creating duplicate categories accidentally as you create subcategories and things like that. It's often little things like that I find catch me out when I'm focused on one part of it and then, oh, I didn't even realize it's changed from product to products. And actually that matters. <laughs> I would also say we've highlighted it about what we call orphan pages, but actually we didn't talk about like traffic. So I'd actually look and see, okay, when you're doing a migration, I would give this or give all of us an opportunity to review the traffic to the pages. Do we actually want to migrate everything or not? Maybe it's a time for a cleanup really to do that and in terms of things that that i've found that's changed with migration actually can be some of the images actually the images don't get pulled through and that's something that yeah you forget about we have a lot of chat in the chat so i just wanted to say a couple of things here that yeah, albert was saying that there's no traffic in the past and we move them once you're talking about doing a content audit then you can see how much how important some of that content is for your business about the traffic and conversions and documenting everything. Sarah was mentioning about when it comes to migration, test it and test again. And of course, yeah, document everything and keep track. Simon's talking about costs could be available. Yeah, it's about resources, the cost to actually do the res to do the work in-house. Sarah was talking about lots of links and stuff to, to the pages to consider. Yeah, Simon's actually saying that all your old con is part of your ecosystem. So it's your digital state. So review basically what you have and move everything. Monty's saying, yeah, Jack is speaking wisely. Every CMS <laughs> works differently. With cleaning content, think about as your house move, like you have lots of, you have lots of stuff, lots of clothes. So do you actually need to move it or not? So yeah, lots of chat in our chat. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I think links there is an important part of it. We haven't talked about backlinks, and I think that that's a huge part of something that can totally get missed when you're migrating pages. You look at the traffic, you look at, like, oh, maybe it's orphaned or whatever, but perhaps that was bringing in links previously. That's an old, good piece of content that was bringing in links previously. I think that can be a real thing. I've totally been guilty of missing that, and then obviously when it gets QA'd by a colleague, being like, you didn't check the backlinks. Oh, yeah, of course. So, yeah, I think Simon, I think, erring on the side of migrating everything can definitely be beneficial depending on the costs, depending on the resources behind it, I think you can argue for clearing some stuff out. I really like Monty's analogy there of moving house, something I did last year, bought my first house with my wife and we're like, we're going to have to be brutal. We're going to have to get rid of loads of stuff and clear stuff out and make sure there's room for us. And then we got another cat. I was like, okay, clear some more stuff out as well. <laughs> but yeah, I think I tend to be on the more cut cutting side of things, the more brutal side of things. But I think that, yeah, you, if you're... If you've got a history of building up great content over the years, there is an argument there to maintain that history and, and keep that ecosystem going as well, like Simon was saying. 
I would just add with all of these things, you you need to do a risk assessment. You need to under, yeah, weigh up the pros and cons of moving the thing and not. And if there are very few cons to it. So if this cost per page thing could come back to that, but if that was like ridiculous, like just really not cost effective, then you could afford. And those pages weren't ever driving any traffic and they held no value. You weigh them up. It's fine. You probably let them four or four. If they were orphaned, unintentionally and actually they had so much potential and the cost was going to be expensive you'd migrate them if it was going to be cheap and you don't know about the pages you'd migrate them so it's that's something you need to take into account with all of these decisions hmm. I, I i've not heard of this cost per page either uh in terms of moving a website and Whoever, I, it'd be interesting to know who is actually charging for that, because if it's an SEO agency, I guess it, if it was us, our objective would be to make sure your migration is really successful. So if those pages are important to your business and, and important to the website, then of course they should be moved. And and so I'm guessing because these ones are maybe last on the list, maybe they're not important to the business. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I think what, like everybody else has said, I would be thinking about how important are these specific pages? So WordPress or whatever has flagged them up as orphan pages, but do they get any traffic? Like Jack said, do they have any links? And were they previous campaign pages? Are they products that you used to stock or something like that? And you're not planning to stock anymore. And if that's the case, maybe you can redirect them to set up a redirect to a, a relevant page. I think the good thing here is it's not, it's just a CMS migration by the sounds of it. And it's not also a domain. It could also be a change of design and, and so on. I think depending on how many other things you're changing, if you are changing content design and, and loads of other things, I would be tempted to move them just to keep as much the same as possible. Something to note with WordPress, I've used, I've, I've had loads of WordPress websites and any CMS, they, I think this is something that Jack covered. They sometimes create URLs for different things. So WordPress, for example, you've got all of the image URLs that you might want to do something with and, and so on. And any plugins that you're using, if they're creating any URLs, if you've got any sort of galleries or product or random product galleries or anything like that, you just need to make sure you're doing a complete crawl of the website beforehand and maybe crawling the new version and just comparing. In terms of... so. Part two of the question was around any common pitfalls of migrations. And I personally, there are loads and it's just all about the planning. Hopefully this isn't a huge website and that therefore isn't quite as risky. And hopefully it's templated so that you can, so that you're not dealing with loads of bespoke random URLs and structures and all of that type of stuff. But I guess the more complex the website, the riskier the migration is. And it's worth spending this time now asking questions like this and feel free to ask more in SEO office hours. The, the, be the best thing you can do, though, is give us as much context as possible. Natalie was mentioning we don't know which CMS you're moving to, whether it is Shopify, HubSpot or something like that. And it would be good to know that. So we, we can share some of those experiences. And a URL always helps because we can then look at the size of the website. And, and in terms of SEO, size does matter. It's, it's, it is really important when it comes to, I've worked on websites that are 30 pages and I've worked on websites that are hundreds of thousands of pages and it's, it's it, migrations are totally different. But yeah, thankfully it's not a domain migration as, as well on top of all of this. Joe, is there anything in the chat, anything else you'd like to add? And nothing else in the chat, but I just wanted to say to everyone that's here and also to those watching afterwards, if you're enjoying SEO Office Hours, like our video when it is live later today, and subscribe to the Good Signals YouTube channel. And for those that are watching us not live, you can also sign up to join us live on goodsignals.com forward slash SEO hyphen office hyphen hours. And Mike will send you the nice calendar invite. Great. Amazing. Thanks, Joe. Next question. Anybody else want to add anything to that one? Actually, we are over halfway and we're not even... We've halfway. only gone two questions. We need to Sorry, do a guys. few more. Okay. Oh, this is to totally different again. So this is somebody interested in working in the SEO industry. Or Bournemouth University student looking for either a four-week placement or a year's placement. I've had no responses from any of my emails that I've sent out so far. Do you have any suggestions on how, how to stand out? to secure a placement. Also, do you recommend to work brand side or agency side? Did anybody do work experience or anything before they got into this? Did you just do it? What's your I, 
I was just going to say, I, I saw something that there's a lady called uh, Marta and uh, she's a product marketing manager and she did a video about hiring her. Uh, I'll share the link in the chat. And it was quite an interesting one because she was let go from a job and how to stand out answering the question. She did a video about marketing herself. In this case, uh, I would say if you've had no response to any of the emails, I don't know how many emails you sent, but it's quite a tough market out there. I think it's always been quite difficult. So just maybe change the subject line of your email. Also try and connect with some of those people on LinkedIn, especially ones that say that they're hiring. Also, if you're a uni student, the university should be helping you, but I was also at uni and they didn't. They're like, it's your problem. So I couldn't get a placement. And then when I got a finished work, then they were like, you don't have any experience. So it's that catch or that cat 22 or chicken and egg. So just keep persevering. Don't give up. Connect with people on LinkedIn. Maybe update your LinkedIn profile as well. I'll share with you the video that Marta did. And uh, open to uh, Jack and Natalie if they have anything else that they'd like to add. I would say clearly demonstrate your interest in the topic. It's it's um, fr from this question, I'm, I'm going to assume these are gen generalist marketing placements or possibly is, is the need to, uh, do they want a placement as an SEO specialist? If it's more just general digital marketing, I might be inclined to target the larger agencies that have the infrastructure that are more likely to be taking on work experience students looking out for age I'd be quite targeted in my approach if it was me um looking for agencies that talk about the placement programs I've had and the agencies that have internship schemes and, and vocational stuff I, an agency I used to work at McCann Manchester had many placement students they not specifically plugging them they had a particular program so if there's agencies like that I'd be starting there but then in terms of standing out, obviously they will be popular and, and highly subscribed. It's about demonstrating the interest. I do feel that digital marketing compared to other industries does have quite a low barrier to entry. I think there's a lot of ways that you can be demonstrating that interest in the topic with all the social media platforms we have, with all of the, with how, how relatively easy it is to spin up a website to demonstrate you're, that you're trying at this b before being a professional. I'd be trying all those kinds of things. Great. Yeah, I yeah. totally agree, Natalie. Yeah, I think having a website of your own, I know so many people talk about this, how important it is to start your SEO career. You can test, you can play around with stuff, you can prove yourself, all that kind of stuff. Having a website of your own or even a blog of your own that shows off your skills and, and your knowledge and all that kind of stuff. And a couple of other test sites to just, oh, if I need to do this thing, or I want to experiment with this thing or whatever it is, being able to literally prove like I have ranked for this thing. I have proven myself that I am an expert in this area. If you search for this, my name comes up. That kind of stuff can be really impressive. I've seen that happen before. We funnily enough had a work experience student here last month here at Canada. And Natalie, I think that's a really good point thinking about which agencies actually have the infrastructure because you can reach out to all the tiny little agencies and you would think oh they're less competitive they're going to get less in there but they just don't have the time because there's so few people and they're all go all the time they would not have somebody there available to support an intern or to support a work placement student so i think it's definitely worth thinking bear in mind we're 25 people here at canada give or take so i think that's a roughly good kind of size i'd be thinking about i know there are far bigger agencies around the uk that are available to do that sort of stuff I think what you said, Joe, about being part of the social media stuff, for me, that's been the biggest change since I've started working at Canada compared to my previous agencies, is being part of this community. Coming on and being on these shows, whether you're watching, listening, participating in these kind of shows, putting your face and your name out there, tweeting stuff, replying to tweets or replying to LinkedIn posts, all that kind of stuff, just so people, oh yeah, I saw you post about that thing. Oh, I saw your name when you, I was watching SEO Office Hours and your name popped up as well. Little things like that can make a huge difference. I got my job here at Canada because I was on LinkedIn and I was talking to Mark. Yeah, it, it does happen even further along in your career, let alone for work placement stuff. So just getting your name and face out there can make a huge difference as well, I think. Great advice. I think also if you mentioned about sending sending emails, just don't blast the same email to everybody. I would try and bespoke it and 
I really think about the type of, say, brands or agencies that you want to work with. And don't be afraid to go a little bit higher up in, in the structure, because I often find that we do link building, for example. And when we do outreach, we, we contact journalists at very busy publications. And some people don't even contact them because they think they're going to be so busy, but actually they do respond. Yeah, just I would bespoke it and explain why. Think about how you could add value, maybe from what you're learning from your course, or if you're doing any side projects or anything like that. Look at the different things that this agency is doing and think about that. But what, one thing that, so the question is about doing either a four week summer placement or doing a year. I would be careful with the year that you don't end up signing up to something for a year and then having to extend your course by an additional year and, and doing something that you don't enjoy. I think work experience is a really good opportunity to go and see what it's actually like to work in an agency or a company as much as doing the work, talking to lots of different people around the company. Like I actually started years and years ago as an intern, I was working brand side. When I left university, I went, a lecturer actually suggested that I get in touch with a particular company. And I actually applied for a job with them rather than work experience. I knew I wasn't going to get it, but it got me in the interview. It got me an interview. And actually, I didn't get the job, but they gave me the opportunity to get some experience. And then I ended up getting a job there after a couple of weeks and so on. But one thing I would say is that people are looking for great talent. So if you've got if you've got certain skills, I don't know whether you're a great copywriter, whether you're interested in PR, it depends on what your course is. People are looking for great people. I would just keep reaching out. Don't give up because there's lots of jobs out there. Do you have anything? Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of chat in our chat. So we also have from, we actually from Simon, like the best way to get into SEO is to not get into SEO. Nice little joke there, Simon. I see what you did there. Yeah. Monty says she always recommends SEO and digital management students to build a website. And also make sure that, as you said also, Jack, if you are working in that field, yeah, to test because you're able to actually have a platform to do that. Ham was talking about having a portfolio. Also in terms of emails, change that subject line, update also, of course, your LinkedIn profile too. Mary also seconded having a portfolio, talking about having a website or blog or where you can show your skills. So see if you're writing, have that on your website. And as Mike said, I wouldn't give up. And in terms of placements, it depends when you're doing this because there's also some universities that, yeah, unfortunately, they may not help you, but you could look to do something like, oh, I'm going to do maybe do a summer placement. Summer is, I'd say, quite good because, and I would say you should you should always be paid for this. Getting paid to work in office tends to be generally a bit higher than working in a Sainsbury's, but nothing wrong with Sainsbury's. I worked in Sainsbury's. I loved it. And you can actually have that 12 weeks to really see and plan what you're doing. And if it's not working, it's totally fine. Oh, because you're going back to university. And no hard feelings, but it gives you like a little bit of a, you can step your, step your toe, dip your toe into that area. Just don't give up. And I just shared a link also about Marta, that it was, a, is a product marketing manager and looking for a job. And she created a video. Don't expect you to do a video because obviously it takes a lot of resources, but it was uh, quite nice what she did. Great. Also, just showing up is quite important. Jack mentioned about getting involved in the community. I went for dinner um, about four weeks ago. Majestic put on a dinner. There were 12 people there. It was free to attend or five pounds or something like that. And a student actually came to that dinner. There were 12 of us. And this student sat opposite the IT director of Domino's next to Dixon, who's like the CEO of InLinks and next to Paddy who Paddy Mugan, who's the CEO of ERA, and for two hours sat there and chatted and would have, they were all talking about who they can introduce this student to and how impressed they were that this student had just turned up to this meal. And so, yeah, do that. You've got things like Brighton SEO next week. You've got the podcast that Jack talked about before. You've got Search London, Search Barcelona. You've got loads of events. Turn up, recommend that. Okay, next question. Crafting our messaging strategy. Curious, how drastically would editing or, oh goodness, I'm sorry guys. Joe, have you got the question there? I've Yes, I'm just writing it down. Day. We were talking about this the other day, need a new system. Okay, crafting our messaging strategy. Curious, how drastically would tweaking or removing homepage content affect our rankings? Jack, how would you feel about kicking off with this one? Absolutely. Yeah. I've got a direct example from a client of mine that I did, I want to say about 18 months ago now, where they essentially had no content on their homepage at all. And I had a conversation with them of, okay, if somebody opens your website, they 
come from Google or they just type it directly, whatever the source is, are they going to know what your business does just by looking at the homepage? And there was a big picture of one of a, a product, I think, but it was so zoomed in. It was that banner image kind of thing where you couldn't really tell what it was. And they have a kind of company name that doesn't really describe what they do. It's a kind of generic kind of thing. So I was like, maybe just add an introductory line in there to say, hey, we are do this thing. You should shop with us because of this. We are proven through our reviews. Here's a link to our trust pilot, et cetera. Just little trust signals like that. And I also updated the page title as well. I'll also hold my hands up to that. And that made a massive difference. And they went from their homepage being one of the because I know we often think about the homepage because it gathers a majority of the links and things like that. It is often going to be a very powerful page on a, on any given site, but their homepage was not. It was definitely not the most clicked on and, and not the most powerful page. And it really made it a, a potent kind of ranking factor now for their site as a whole and really pushed them forward. So I think it was four sentences in total just on that banner across like the top of the banner image displaying what they do, why you should shop with them, and why they're different from their competitors, essentially, including some very specific copy and briefs from me of, hey, you want to rank for this kind of thing? We're talking about the primary, secondary, tertiary keywords, topic clusters, all that kind of stuff. This is really, in my opinion, the homepage should be the really high level stuff. What is your business about? We are a digital marketing agency. You should talk about being a digital marketing agency. You don't necessarily need to go straight into specific services and specific products and stuff like that. You leave your service pages and your product pages to do that. This should be the really high level broad kind of topics. And I I think I blew my client's mind. They're like, oh yeah, of course. How, how come we hadn't thought of that beforehand? Of course we should be describing our business on the homepage. And yeah, it, it was a, a big success story for them. Uh, amazing. Natalie, do you have anything to add? I would just, so much of what I, I agree with everything that, that Jack said. I think the question about how drastically will it impact it is dependent on what what's there at the moment what you want to add. So what is the page ranking for? If it's if you've got a situation where you have a page that does have a volume of content on it and it's ranking very well for a keyword group, <clears throat> I would not recommend doing away with all that text and pivoting to a more image-led kind of design. Do not do that. That can be disastrous. I've seen that happen. But if you don't have... It may not be the text on your page that is supporting you for ranking for these kinds of keywords, but it's not, content is not the only thing that will be causing the page to be authoritative in that space. So I'm so sorry that it depends again, but it really does. More detail would help give a, you, we could be much more specific on how it will affect it if you knew exactly what we were comparing against. But Joe, do you have anything to add? I wanted to say that I would actually not underestimate having other people feedback that are not actually at your company or at that they're so close to the product. It could be your friends, family, to to show them this is our this is what we suggest for our current website, the new website, and see what they say. Because sometimes when you're really close to a product or service or your own company, really, it's amazing how much information about that company you do not put on your own homepage. So I would really never underestimate the power of just getting feedback before you make anything live. Um, yeah, that we're nothing in the chat about this question, but some very good answers from Jack and Natalie. I love bringing in my wife as a second pair of eyes because she does not work in SEO. She just discovered that SGE was a thing like yesterday and we had a whole conversation about it. She saw the article on the BBC and was like, is this true? Is this real? Yes, I've been talking about it on the podcast for six months. Yes. And having that conversation with her, like, here's a website. What do you think about it? Like she is a, a regular internet user, uses lots of different services, Reddit, all that kind of stuff. Like she's been actively on the internet for two decades at this point. And there's that element of, okay, do I understand this just from looking at it? Am I going at it with a non SEO pair of eyes and actually as a customer, as a user and try and switch that part of your brain off. And I know we're all guilty of that, of not being able to switch it off. You, as soon as you see a website, you start looking at different tags and looking at the HTML and things like that. I, I know I can't help myself, but bringing in my wife as a fresh set of eyes, I find 
so so useful sometimes i'm not doing it with client websites i'm not breaking ndas just to clarify <laughs> but like for, for my own sites and stuff like that i'll be like does this make sense if you you have no idea about this topic does this make sense to you and that could be really useful i totally agree joe um that reminds me an ex-partner of mine she was a product manager for a tech company and at the time we were living with her mum and I remember she said, whenever they had a new feature, she would ask her mum to test it. And then they would end up in a full blown row because her mum would never press the button that she wanted. Uh, sorry, it just reminded me of that then when you said that, Jack. I, th I think this is actually a bit of a challenge that some people that start a CRO program can have when they just focus on conversion rates mm -hmm. and it's really easy to increase conversion rates by removing tons of stuff from your web page or website for instance if you create a huge buy now button right in the middle and remove everything else chances are more people will probably press it and so on but that doesn't that what you have to take in account there is actually the impact on traffic and so on. And, and that used to be a real problem with people using some of the CRO tools available. They're a bit better now, but that was something, and especially now there's SEO testing tools you can run both at the same time. It depends in terms of, like Natalie said, it depends on context. If your homepage, if it just ran, uh, if it just ranks for your branded terms and it doesn't rank for any other sort of commercial terms, then if anything, you're probably just going to gain if you're adding more content and providing that messaging. Joe mentioned about actually testing that messaging. I've never actually used it, but I've heard really good things about winter where you can test messaging in front of a panel of people that fit your market. And it's a tool run by Pep from CXL. That's his current business. And that to me sounds really good. But yeah, like Natalie was saying, I would have a look and see what do you currently rank for? What does your homepage rank for? And is there an opportunity to help strengthen the rest of the website and actually gain some rankings for that particular page? But it is also, yeah, it's good that you've asked this question. Don't take it lightly. Make sure if you are making major changes to your homepage or any kind of key commercial pages, definitely use it. I've been using seotesting.com quite a bit recently where you pull, it pulls your data from Google Search Console and you can do it at page level, website section level or across the entire site. So it's not very expensive. And maybe as you're making these changes, set up a couple of tests, it will look at, it will take the traffic into account say you can do two, four, six weeks beforehand and then look at it afterwards. It's not perfect, but at least it gives you an indication. Um, caveat, if you are doing that and you have a seasonal business, just bear that in mind that if I don't do it at the beginning or end of a season, because then if you can say, great, traffic's gone up, this is fantastic. And actually you're just going into a busy period. You won't learn anything. Anything else to add or should we move up with us so running out of time? We just um, got six minutes left. So I did want to have a like, one minute before we close, just to talk about the plans for April and fine. so we we'll just okay. I'm gonna try and let's do a, we never do quick fires, but let's go for it. Okay. I'm gonna hit you with this one if that's all right. Could you suggest any AI tools for internal links or internal linking? Okay, so it, I would, I don't have oh, it. Sorry, Joe. I was going to pass it on to Jack if that's all okay, right. Okay, good. No, that's totally fine. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely can recommend a couple. I know the guys at Optimizer and their content optimization tools, they have an internal link thing. I was playing around with it a couple of weeks ago and it is really cool. It will basically hide, you can feed it your sitemap and it will basically pick out various different topics, feed it some keywords, feed it your pages and it will basically pick out, oh, this looks like good anchor text. Why aren't you linking to this page and all that kind of stuff? So yeah, that's my experience with, with a recent tool. I'm sure there are plenty of other options out there, but yeah, I recommend the, I think it's called Optimize by Optimizer and... Uh, Go and check those guys out. And Joe, have you used have you used in, in links? Does that as well, right? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, yes, I've used in links and I'd recommend uh trying out in links to analyze your internal linking uh of your site. I'll share the chat in the chat. In links is a great shout. Yeah. I meant positional, not optimizer. It is called optimize. It is but by positional. I apologize. I named the wrong positional. tool. <laughs> positional is the name of the company. Yeah. I, I will put a link in the chat for you guys in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. And then next question, Natalie, I'm going to start with you on this one, if that's all right. What are you most excited about in terms of SEO? <laughs> what am I most excited about? I am more excited to do the job than ever because of the many changing things with AI and how that may or may not impact our practices. I'm not saying I'm absolutely looking forward to the integration of SGE into 
UK search results. We still don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm interested. We're living in interesting times. I'd say it's that, probably. How worried are you about SGE? Is that something that you are worried about or not? That's something that keeps coming up, actually. I, it's, I still feel it's just one of those things that I can't really prepare for yeah. because yeah. there's so much speculation. I think just yesterday, the speculation over whether it's going to be a paid for element yeah. or is, is it going to be integrated into organic? We just don't know. So is it even going to sit with organic or is it going to sit with paid? We don't know. But but that's all very interesting and it keeps us on our toes. Um, I, I My worries about answers generated by an LLM is that they're still not perfect. It's so much better than when we all were introduced to ChatGPT. When was it? 18 months ago? Like you, you lose track. When answers were terrible, at least now... <laughs> some of them are indistinguishable from something created by a human being my, my main concerns with all of these things are misinformation disinformation and people just believing any old thing i worry about more of that showing up in google search results great not great but thank you for you <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not great but it definitely i think that's one of the best things about this industry is the change and i guess it keeps us all in jobs right because we've got to keep up with it and then we can give some form of direction or yeah so that that's what makes the job interesting i think that's it i don't worry that it's taking my job i think it will be a while before it it takes our jobs are going to invo- evolve but I, I think there's so much that's going to need tidying up that digital marketing specialists is still going to be very much required to navigate this SGE thing. Jack, very quickly, if you don't mind, what are you most excited about in terms of SEO at the moment? It's along similar lines, to be honest, as what Natalie said. I think you're totally right. A lot of people saying, oh, no, it's going to take our jobs. I see it the other way around. We're getting more and more digital every day, it seems. So I feel like digital marketing and especially digital marketing specialists like ourselves and like the people in chat and that kind of thing are more important than ever for businesses, people, businesses realizing how important this stuff is and how integral it is to so many sides of different companies and things like that. I think it's going to be a big shift for us. And I know a lot of people have been in the industry a lot longer than I have said, oh, I can't wait for this change. It's felt like it's been stale for a few years. We've been doing the same thing for the last decade, give or take. So it's nice to have a big shakeup and something more interesting. So I'm actually quite excited to be such a part of the community at the moment because it feels like everything's bubbly and exciting. I can't remember what it was called, but I love playing with anything new and shiny. And there's the the AI tool that was in Rolling Stones magazine the other day where you can create a song. I think it's like Sunno or something like that, but you can create a song with a prompt. And I was having so much fun with that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's quite cool. Not for artists, I get, but I just mean just fun to play with. Joe, you wanted a minute. You got it. Yeah, great. Thank you. So I'm really excited about all the events that are taking place. We did have a break last Friday. We're taking another little break next Friday because Mike is on holiday with his family and I'll be speaking at a company called, at an event called Traffic in Girona. There's lots of events taking part and of course at the end of the month we have Brighton SEO. So I'm sorry we weren't doing SEO office hours but we will be seeing um, some of you guys at Brighton SEO. We'll be back in one week, in two weeks time and I wanted to say thank you very much for everyone for joining us today and thank you to our guests Jack and Natalie. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a lovely weekend and see you in two weeks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.